most sad and ungracious of all places. Without a view, without woods, without water, without earth. For it is either quicksand or marsh without good air. As a result, it cannot be good for anyone. It pleased the king to tyrannize nature and to dominate her by force of art and money. He built everything without a general design, the beautiful, the ugly, the vast, and the constricted. At eight o'clock every morning, the king was awoken by his first valet de chambre, who slept in the room with him. At the same time, the first physician and the first surgeon were admitted, and as long as she lived, the king's former wet nurse also came in and would kiss him. He would then be rubbed down because he perspired a great deal, and at a quarter past eight, the great chamberlain was admitted, and together with those members of the court who had the grande entrée. The great chamberlain then opened the curtains around the bed and offered him holy water. The chamberlain then handed the king the book of the office of the Holy Ghost, 
and retired to the next room with everyone else. Then the second entree was admitted, and a few minutes later, the body of the court. By the time they came in, the king was getting into his breeches, for he put on his clothes by himself. He accomplished this with considerable grace. He was shaved every day, with a, sorry, every other day, with the court watching, and while it was being done, he wore a short wig, without which he never allowed himself to be seen. When the king had finished dressing, he knelt down at the side of his bed and said his prayer. Next he went into his study, followed by what amounted to quite a gathering. He then announced his appointments for the day so that everyone knew exactly what he would be doing every quarter of an hour. Now Carthusian monk leads a quieter and more solitary life than I do. Every day except Sunday and Thursday, I rise at nine. Then I kneel down to say my prayers and read my psalm and Bible chapter. After that, I wash myself as clean as I can. Thereafter, I ring for my chambermaids who come in to dress me. At a quarter to eleven, I am dressed, and then I read and write.
The courtiers waited in the gallery until the king was ready to go to mass at which the choir always sang a motet. The ministers were told the moment he had gone to the chapel and they then gathered in the king's study and as soon as mass was over, the council met and that was the last engagement for the morning. My dear aunt, I have to laugh that you are glad that I am not taken in by the bawling of laughter. Except for a few real symptoms, no one here is taken in by it. Only one goes to these places in order not to scandalize the populace. Our king does not know one word of the scripture because he never allowed to read it. He thinks that as long as he listens to his confessor and mumbles his pater nostrils, everything is fine and he is perfectly pious. Yesterday, I gave Madame de Chateauvier a beautiful parrot which talks amazingly well. I wanted to hear what it could say and let it into my room. My dogs became jealous, and one of them, by the name of Mione, started to bark at it. The parrot kept saying, Give me your paw! I wish your grace could have seen how surprised Mione was to hear the bird talk. She stopped barking, stared at it, then looked at me. And when it continued to talk, she took fright like a human being, ran away and hid under the de bed. And at that point, the parrot screamed with laughter. <laughs> Louis XIV loved, above all, splendor, magnificence, and profusion. This taste he turned into a political maxim and inspired the whole court to adopt it. I appreciate the Germans' sincerity more than I appreciate magnificence. And I am only sorry to hear that this is being lost, lost in my father. It is easy to understand how luxury drives out good faith. One cannot be magnificent 
without money. And if money becomes so important, one becomes calculating. And once one has become calculating, one seeks every possible means of getting something. Which opens the door to falseness, lying, and cheating. And this, in turn, drives out good faith, loyalty, and sincerity. The king himself, always dressed in brownish colors with a light embroidery, something, nothing, sometimes something except gold buttons, sometimes black velvet. The waistcoat was always cloth or satin in red, blue, or green, and heavily embroidered. Never any rings or jewels, except on his shoe buttons and on his garters. And the hat was always bordered with Spanish point lace with a white plume. Heavy scents gave him headaches, so he only allowed orange flower water. <laughs> And there are some with which I have nothing to do. Panniers I never wear, and loose gowns, sack, I abhor, and will not even admit into my presence. To me, they seem indecent, and look as if one has got straight out of bed. There is no method about the fashions here. Tailor, dressmakers, and hairdresser invent them as they please. The coiffure are getting higher every day. I think they will finally have to make the doors taller, for otherwise these ladies will no longer be able to go in and out of the rooms. <laughs> when they are wearing wimples, they look just like the water spirit, Melusine, and I believe that the train on their dresses will eventually turn into a snake, just as she did. <laughs>
The king felt neither heat nor cold, and wet weather affected him very little. That would be very bad indeed to stop him from going out. <laughs> At least once a week he went stag hunting. He was a first class shot. Most other days he would just walk around, having a look at whatever building was in progress. Occasionally he would take ladies out and have a picnic in the forests at Marly or Fontainebleau. This morning we caught a stag. The weather is perfectly beautiful and one cannot think of a more agreeable place than the preserve where we hunt. There are 10 or 12 avenues which are like a real vault. Six or eight of the avenues form stars. This morning it was not too warm because there was a cool breeze. The forest is full of cowslips and violets. Together with the young foliage, this gives a wonderful smell to the air. The woods are full of nightingales. If one follows a false lead, as happened to me today, and does not hear the sounds of hounds and bugles, one still has this lovely music. King would always be kind if he were allowed to follow his own inclinations. But he is often made to change his mind. No one at this court has more courtly manner than he himself. There was one occasion on which Louis XIV outwardly so equable, so perfectly controlled in his slightest gestures succumbed to his impulses. As he rose from the table at Marly, accompanied by the ladies and in the presence of the entire court, he happened to see one of the dessert footmen pocket a sweet biscuit. That instant, his royal dignity forgotten, a cane in hand, he rushed on the man, he thrashed him, he cursed him, and he broke the cane across his shoulder. And then, still holding one end of it, and still abusing the servant, who by this time had fled, he crossed the little salon and the anteroom into Madame de Maintenon's apartment, and he stayed there more than an hour. <laughs>
Upon returning, he perceived his confessor among the courtiers and cried out to him, Father, I have just thrashed a rascal soundly. I have broken my cane on him, but I do not think God will be displeased by that. And there and then he confessed to him that so-called crime. The unhappy priest made approving noises through his clenched teeth to prevent the king from becoming still angrier in a public place. The victory of France and Spain over Holland in 1701 was crowned by the arrival of a Spanish fleet with more than 60 millions worth of gold and silver and 12 millions in merchandise. When some of the ships were being unloaded in Spain, eight vast packing cases were discovered and they were labeled chocolates for the very reverend the Father General of the Society of Jesus. They were so heavy that they seemed likely to break the backs of the carriers who promptly demanded double pay on account of the weight. This aroused so much comment that when the crates arrived at the warehouse of Cadiz, the officers opened one of them, and when one of the bars was lifted out, the weight of it was phenomenal. They tried another one with the same result, and they tried to break it, but without success. As they redoubled their efforts, however, one bar burst open when they discovered that the crates were entirely filled with gold bars covered with a finger-thick layer of chocolate. Madrid was notified, and there was much mirth. The Jesuits were also informed, but to no purpose, because they preferred to lose their precious chocolate rather than to admit ownership. In the end, the King of Spain got the gold and the chocolate went to the men who discovered the trick. <laughs> I can drink neither tea, nor chocolate, nor coffee. All this foreign stuff is repugnant to me. I find chocolate too sweet, coffee tastes like soot, to me, and tea more like medicine. In short, in this respect, as in many others, I cannot be a la mode. <laughs>
1709. Everything in France is visibly deteriorating. The nation is exhausted, the troops unpaid, disheartened by bad leadership, and therefore never successful. The finances are bankrupt, the generals and ministers incapable, promotions come only by favor or intrigue, no faults are punished, no inquiries held, no councils of war. It is equally impossible to fight or to make peace. Silence and misery are everywhere. As I was driving through Paris, I saw people running about, looking all upset, and some of them were saying, ah, mon Dieu. All the windows were full of people, and some of them had climbed on the roof. Down below, stores were being closed up and house locks on the doors. Even the Palais Royal was closed. I did not understand what the meaning of all this was. But when I came into the inner courtyard and alighted, a townswoman came to me and said, Do you know, madame, that there is a revolt in Paris that has been going on since four o'clock this morning? I thought the woman was mad and began to laugh. But she said, I'm not crazy, madame. What I'm telling you is true. So true, 40 people have been killed. The high price of everything, especially of bread, was causing riots in every part of the kingdom. The Dauphin, on his way to and from the opera in Paris, had several times been held up by mobs containing large numbers of women screaming for bread. He finally escaped by throwing money among them and promising miracles. <laughs> All year long, I eat at noon all by myself and hurry as much as possible. For it is annoying to eat alone and to have 20 fellows stand around looking into one's mouth and counting every bite. Therefore, I am done in less than half an hour. At night, I eat with the king, where we are five or six at table. Everyone just eats away as in a monastery, without saying anything, except perhaps a whispered word to a neighbor. The king's supper was served at 10 o'clock 
always au grand couvert, a large meal. And the entire royal family sat down with him. The king was frequently late, and the entire meal did not start until 11.30. The meal was attended by a large number of people, both those who were entitled to be seated and those who were not. Very soon after I was delivered of my daughter, Monsieur began to sleep in a different bed. And I did not enjoy the business enough to ask him to return to my bed. When His Grace slept in my bed, I had to lie so close to the edge that I sometimes fell out of bed in my sleep. For his grace did not like to be touched. And if perchance I happened to stretch a foot in my sleep and to touch him, he would wake up and scold me for half an hour. I've never heard of such a thing as a goose down blanket. What keeps me nice and warm in my bed are six little dogs that lie around me. No blanket is as warm as the good little dogs. <laughs> but before he retired to bed, the king went to feed his dogs. And then he said good night, and going into his room, he knelt down at his bedside to say his prayers. After he'd undressed, he would bow. This meant good night. And at that sign, all the court would retire. <laughs>
our great thanks to the Dryden Ensemble for this exquisite eyewitness guide to Versailles and to Roberta Maxwell and Paul Hecht for their dramatic readings. giving us an insight into daily life at the court of Louis XIV. Excuse my voice. <laughs> my name is John Teese, and I'm executive director of Gotham Early Music Scene. Midtown concerts are generously supported by you, our audience, as well as our sponsors, the Howard Gilman Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts. Thank you. For our online viewers, please visit gemsny.org and show your support for this series by making a generous donation. Join us next Thursday at 1.15 here for House of Time in a program entitled Angels and Demons. You won't want to miss that. That's next Thursday at 1.15 here at St. Malachy's Church, the Actors Chapel on West 49th between Broadway and 8th Avenue in beautiful Manhattan. Thank you. Thank you.